So let's talk about our presentation for tonight. Um, we're gonna talk about the water quality on the Harpeth River with Dr. Ryan Jackwood. So I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Ryan Jackwood. Dr. Jackwood joined the Harpeth Conservancy as the Watershed Science and Restoration Program Director in March of 2019. He provides strategic direction for his science-based programs and implements restoration priorities based on water quality assessment. Ryan is originally from Ohio, where he earned a bachelor's degree from Ohio State University and has a master's and doctor degree from the University of Toledo. Toledo. Toledo? Toledo. Toledo. Oh my gosh, Toledo. <laughs> In Ohio, uh, researching issues on water quality and harmful allergy blooms in on Lake Erie. So please welcome Dr. Ryan Jackwood. Thanks a lot, Stephanie. Um, can ever can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Okay. Perfect. Um, so I'm Ryan. I am the science director for the Harpeth Conservancy. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our organization before I kind of jump into one of the programs that um, we launched last year. Um, but the vision for our organization is clean water and healthy ecosystems for rivers championed by the people who live here. And that's one of the things that we're really passionate about is giving people who live here kind of the opportunity to really participate in helping to preserve the rivers. Um, some of the kind of avenues and um, I'll say areas of expertise that we have and areas that we work in. Um, we, can, um, we work in restoration. So that can be anything from implementation projects to rain garden restoration or tree plantings. Uh, we work on issues, pollution problems, um, state we, um, uh, we have an effective statewide clean water group um, that meets um, pretty regularly and then growth strategies as well. Um, obviously anyone familiar with kind of the Franklin area right now, it's growing out of control. So we're also kind of involved in that. Um, we wanna give voice to people and kind of help them um, be involved in the decisions and legislation that may be relevant to um, our environment and rivers. Um, of course, educate people about the importance of rivers. Um, and then certainly recreation about responsible recreation are, you know, Sometimes we've got spots that there's too many kayaks or too many canoes on the river and they're battling with fishermen about, you know, who gets to use that space. And so that's, there can be a real challenge in some spots. And then of course, science, which is kind of my passion and um, kind of the science projects and programs that we do. Um, most of those kind of areas fit into one of four of our, I'll call these like program areas or kind of how our organization is divided. Um, we've got our clean water protection program, which is basically our, our policy and legislation side, um, community engagement, which is education and outreach, science and restoration, and then rural protection and land use. And that's kind of that land growth and making sure that we're sustainably using um, land and making sure we grow sustainably so we, um, so we can kind of better plan for the future and for climate change. Okay, so I'll launch into kind of this, um, this program project that um, we started last summer. And I really wanted to start doing some water quality sampling um, along the Harpeth River and make it kind of a regular reoccurring thing. Now we've done water quality studies in the past where we've gone out for a couple months and looked at a particular location or a particular pollutant that we were concerned about. But this is a reoccurring, kind of a regular reoccurring thing, water quality sampling that we're, we're currently doing. And so I wanna set this up by saying, okay, why are we going to do this? So as many of you probably know, 42% um, of the streams in the state are actually considered impaired. And what impaired means is that the state has gone and done an assessment 
and determined that one of a half dozen, I think it might even be up to 10 things is currently not meeting standards that would be appropriate to provide a healthy environment for wildlife. And so that can be anything from um, pathogens, um, excess nutrients that cause a lot of algae growth, um, low dissolved oxygen that can cause fish kills, habitat loss. Um, another one is sedimentation or erosion. And so there's this huge kind of laundry list of things that if the river or stream does not meet the criteria set by the state, they can be considered impaired. And obviously impaired is not good for a lot of different reasons, but you know we're worried about fish and wildlife and then of course, recreation and human health. And so I'm gonna focus on one today and that's pathogens indicated by E. coli. Now, I'll kind of touch on this again in a little bit, but just to kind of set it up. Pathogens are bacteria that can cause um, basically illness, infection in humans. And so anytime that there's a lot of pathogens in the water, if you go swimming or you go you know, family day out to the river or go kayaking and you ingest enough of the water, you can get sick. So I told you about how kind of the state goes in a, in, and assesses these rivers. Well, the state goes out and assesses the rivers um, on a five-year rolling basis. So if the Harpeth is impaired with pathogens four years ago, it's still gonna be impaired, but the last time they took a sample would have been four years ago. And they might not do it again until next year. Um, the issue with that is that pathogens can be very volatile. They can be really high one day, really low the next day. So that's a little bit of a setup and I'll get to kind of why that's important. Some com common pathogens we um, find in surface water. Um, some of these may sound familiar, but Salmonella, Legionnaires disease, Shigella, and then E. coli. And E. coli is kind of the one that we focus on because it is very cheap and easy to test for. And it's a good indicator that other pathogens are also present. So we test for one of them and then make the assumption that there's probably a bunch of other ones um, in there. So ways that E. coli and these other pathogens can actually enter our rivers, streams, um, lakes. Uh, wastewater, of course, is one. Um, agricultural sources, you know, anything from manure, a lot of these um, pathogens come from the, you know, uh, feces of any kind of warm-blooded animal. So it could be anything from, you know, maybe there's a dog park that's pretty close to the stream, the stream or river, and you get a good rain and it just washes straight in. It might be carrying a lot of pathogens. Um, certainly dumps and hazardous waste, and then, you know, uh, you know, septic, septic leakage as well. A lot of, a lot of people, especially, um, especially at least where I'm from in Ohio, people didn't, you know, they would buy a house and they didn't realize that they were on septic and didn't realize that you actually had to maintain a septic tank. And they just, you know, it would be, you know, it wouldn't be cleaned out for 30 years. And so those things can start leaking pretty bad. And so we, we've seen that a lot too. Um, I'll kind of give you a couple little um, news stories, but I just kind of did a, like a, a brief, you know, Google search about, you know, E. coli advisories, but um, essentially almost over half of all beaches along the East Coast, West Coast, Gulf Coast, Great Lakes um, experience some form of, they have to post an advisory because E. coli and these pathogens are just too hot. So we're saying, too high, bacteria is too high, we do not recommend that you go swimming today. Um, and kind of inter interestingly enough, um, one of the worst swimming areas um, was Myrtle Beach in South Carolina. And 70 out of 82 days that tested the beach exceeded the EPA standard for um, pathogens in E. coli. And so that's, that's a big deal. I mean, that's, you know, we're talking about public health. We're talking about warning people that, you know, if you go in the water, it might not be safe. Sure, you know, you might not get sick, but then we don't want, you know, then if you do get sick, then, you know, we could have prevented it. And so a lot of places around the country are doing this 
you know, doing E. coli sampling on a regular basis so they can inform the general public when recreation is safe and when there should be some sort of advisory or warning or whatever it may be to at least help people um, use best practices or make sure they wash their hands after they get in the water, um, that kind of thing. Um, another study was published in 2018 and it basically was saying that, you know, we have, I think swimming caused almost, or um, I'm sorry, uh, these pathogens caused almost 30 million people that um, an illness, a mild or moderate illness. Um, and I think this, I'd have to look again, but I think this was a couple year study, but almost 30 million people got sick because of, because they were swimming in a body of water that was contaminated with pathogens one way or another. And then you can kind of see the other numbers here. Kayaking was half a million. Rowing was, a, you know, 0.4 million. Canoeing, you know, 0.75. Then you get higher with motorboating because you get that spray in the air. And then fishing, you know, also was one of, you know, it was pretty high too. Fishing was 15 million. And so, the economic impact of these illnesses was about $3 billion per year. So all of that to say that this is an important issue and in Tennessee, I don't think that we sample enough or that we are warning the general public in a way that is beneficial to them and that they can prevent these public health, the threats to their public health. Um, I'm not gonna worry about this slide too much, but keep in mind this 235, the CFU, which is called colony forming units. And that's basically how we measure E. coli. So 235 is when, when the EPA says, stop, we think that if, if E. coli is a higher than that 235 number, we don't think that you, we don't recommend that you go swimming. And so that's kind of our target value. That's what we're looking at to say, whether, you know, what, if we think if E. coli is going to be higher than that, then we want to warn the general public. If it's lower than that, then everything's, you know, probably fine. Okay, so how do we determine, how do we take a sample of E. coli and figure out how much is actually in a body of water? So what we do is we go out, physically collect the sample, um, take it back to the lab, and then we actually have to grow the bacteria. And then we leave it in an incubator overnight for 24 hours. And then the next day we would come in and we physically can count the number of E. coli that have grown on that bacterial plate. Now, this is important because if I'm gonna, if you're gonna take your, you know, your kids or your family out and go, you know, swimming in a beach or go paddling along a river. If you want to go Monday morning and I'm out there collecting a sample Monday morning, it's going to take me 24 hours before I can tell you whether or not that it was safe to be in the water that day. That doesn't do you any good if you want to get in the water on Monday morning. And so this is kind of what the test looks like. We use a, um, we use a re reagent that you can pour in the sample of water. We grow it in an incubator, and then we actually, the reagent has, um, has proteins that bind to E. coli, and the E. coli actually glow under a black light. And we can count those wells the next day, and that's how we figure out how much E. coli is in that sample. And okay, so yeah, finish, to finish my thought, basically, we wanted to, we want to make sure that we are Yes, we're collecting samples and figure out how much E. coli is in that sample, but then we need to figure out a way to be able to warn you on Monday morning whether or not it's safe to be in the water, even though I'm just taking that sample just right then and there. So I'll kind of tell you how we do that. Basically, we do that using a predictive model. And so almost like a weather forecast for E. coli. So you can look on, you know, eventually you'll be able to look on our website and um, you know, see the forecast for that day and then make a decision whether you want, maybe you want to go to, um, you know, the Piney River that day, or maybe you want to go to the Harpeth or, you know, um, 
any of the other kind of rivers maybe make a decision based on that forecast. Like I said, it's kind of like a weather forecast in that sense. And I'll kind of give a brief example of how we do that. So here are some numbers. I don't worry about necessarily where the locations are. Um, some of you may be familiar with some of them or some of these were, or some of these locations kind of might ring a bell. But suffice it to say that remember that 235 number I was talking about? Well, you can see that the average of all the sites that we're currently sampling are well above that 235 number. So we know that there's a problem at, at these locations. And right now we're doing, um, we're collecting samples at the Harpeth River, Richland Creek in Nashville, and then Mill Creek, which is kind of on the southeastern side of Nashville. And so we're, we're seeing elevated um, numbers for E. coli. And this column all the way over here on the right is the maximum number that we've seen at some of these sites. And if you can see 2,400 is substantially higher than 235, which would again be our threshold for swimming or playing in the, recreating in the river at all. So this is something that really kind of popped out at us and we really wanted to pursue how do we get this information out to the general public and how do we create this forecast model to be able to tell them whether it's safe or not? Because we get, I mean, we get calls all the time with people that, you know, they, you know, have, you know were sick a couple, you know, have been sick for a couple of days and they were in the river and they were wanted to know if it's possible that the river could have done that. And we're like, you know, yeah, it's certainly possible. You know, they can't say for sure, but that's, that's totally plausible that that was, you know, the cause of your illness. Okay, so I'll do a brief kind of example of how we do this um, forecasting model. Okay, so this would be a time series for the amount of E. coli that we're finding in um, one of our locations along Richland Creek. So the blue line is E. coli. So we sampled on September 3rd in 2020, then on the 24th in 2020, so on and so forth. The red line is that EPA 235 threshold that I keep saying. So you can see, you know, on September, September 3rd, you know, we would have wanted to, you know, put an advisory out that day because it's substantially higher than uh, what the EPA recommends. Now, you know, later in September, early October, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of, you know, it was in the kind of the safe zone is what I'll say. But then it popped back up, you know, late October. Um, same thing on this bottom graph, but this is just for 2021. You know, we see some of the days are above 235, some of the, you know, some of the samples are below. So what we want to do is we want to take the data that we currently have, and since it takes 24 hours to process, we want to find as much other environmental data or weather data that we can collect and use in real time. So that might be anything from maybe it's you know the temperature, air temperature outside. You know it's easy. You know I can go to Weather Underground and look it up right now. Maybe it's you know the amount of precipitation that's occurred over the last 24 hours. Um, there's tons of um, USGS flow gauge sites, you know, along all of our rivers. You can look up real-time information from those and basically take all of that real-time information and use it to predict the amount of E. coli that's in the river at that given location and time. So that might be a lot, but bear with me. So in this graph, we have very similar thing. We've got our same E. coli line, so the blue line. But then I went and I, I overlaid it with the amount of flow in Richland Creek. And if you see, the amount of flow actually follows pretty closely with the amount of E. coli. Now it's not perfect, but it follows pretty closely. Same within 2021, you know, it's not directly on top of the blue line, but it follows the same general trend. And so we can use relationships like that um, and flow is a really good one. Precipitation is usually a really good one. Um, one that we often use as well is called turbidity, which basically measures the cloudiness of the water. E. coli really likes to be attached to sediment. So if the water is really cloudy, um, that's usually a pretty good indicator that there's gonna be high levels of E. coli. And so we basically can take these relationships 
And so here's kind of your E. coli on the bottom and your river flow on top. And this black line would be a perfect relationship. Uh, you know, so it, it's, it's obviously not perfect, but this is a pretty good relationship between E. coli and river flow. And so I would say, okay, great. You know, maybe it's just that. So maybe every Monday morning I wake up and I look at the river flow in Richland Creek and I say, okay, it's at 20. So I'll go over and here's my black line model right here. And I'll say, there's gonna be approximately 1200 or you know, 1100 E. coli in the river on this day. Um, and so then I can, you know, in 15 minutes, I can come up with at least, at least a prediction of the amount of E. coli. Um, you know, and if the flow is at, you know, seven, then, you know, similar thing, then I'm like, oh, it's gonna be below 235. So I don't need to worry about it today. So that's kind of a very basic way that we, that how we build these models. Now, um, so here's kind of the end result basically, but you know, this would be day to day on the, on the bottom down here. And basically the, the, um, the samples that we collected are the black line and then the model is predicting the red line. And so the idea is that the, that the red line follows the black line essentially, but it does a pretty good job. And that's just using one variable in river flow, whereas we're gonna be building models that have three or four variables all in them together to make the most accurate model as we can. Um, so what predictor data should we use? I kind of mentioned, I kind of threw some of these out earlier, but you know, temperature, precipitation, dew point even might be you know, an interesting one to look at. So weather data, there's a ton of weather data that we can explore. Um, environmental data as well, turbidity, you know, anything, any probe that's in the water that's giving, you know, real-time measurements, we can really use any of those just as long as we can get it in real time. Um, so this is just a similar graph to the one I just showed you, but this is kind of one that I, a model that I built out kind of, you know, fairly fully, it's not totally done yet, but just kind of gives you an idea of what it looks like at the end. It's kind of a lot, don't worry too much about you know, all the lines and everything. But the idea is again, that the red line should be following the black line as close as possible. And then kind of reporting re results. So like I mentioned that there are, you know, places all over the country doing this type of, um, this type of program and they've got websites to help, you know, inform people going to the beach or going to the river. Um, and so, you know, Madison, Wisconsin, on the lower right, you know, they've got a thumbs up, thumbs down system that they use. Um, e. coli uses kind of a, you know, green and red kind of situation. Um, you know, I like the stoplight kind of model, green, yellow, red. Um, that's kind of what um, Dade County and Miami do. They do, you know, red is poor, yellow is moderate, green is good. So just to kind of give you an idea of like, visually what it would look like for, the general public actually looking at the forecast once it's all set up. And with that, I'll kick it back over to Stephanie. I think she's got some other slides that she wants to share. I wonder how they do that. I know that there's, they at least will post it on their website. I don't know if I've seen an annual report from the city, but I'm sure they must do one. I just don't know okay. if I've ever had to like the need to go look it up. Okay, I'll, I'll look for it. Thanks for letting me know that turbidity would be the closest yeah, well, that would be the thing that you would want to look for. And I'll tell you that if it's like below 20, it's probably a fairly clear day. But if you get it you get anything it. like 50 to 100 or even above that, I've seen measurements go like up over a thousand and it's basically chocolate milk at that point. But sometimes these rivers can get like that. Yeah, mostly that's going to go with flow and precipitation mm -hmm. too, right? Oh, for sure. <laughs> basically, when it rains, you get a lot of that, a lot of that sediment coming off of parking lots, anything that hasn't been disturbed in a couple of weeks. And it, it's just gonna, it takes it all and that. That's why it, it, it gets really cloudy. And one more silly little question, but you said something about the E. coli needs the sediment to attach to. It doesn't uh, need it, it prefers to attach to sediment. So okay. basically it has an affinity to, to attach to it, but E. coli can still be free floating without being attached. Without to the sediment, okay. Yeah. Um, but but we, it, oh, go ahead. I was just trying to think of a way to prevent this. Is, is oh. 
preventing sediment, would that help? Or is it um, better to prevent the contamination? Uh, preventing sediment would certainly help. It would, it would definitely help. Um, the other thing I'll mention too, is that I was, I was wait, waiting to see if you were gonna ask me this question, but um, since E. coli likes to be attached to sediment, it oftentimes will, obviously sediment, you know, during, you know, slow dry days will settle to the bottom of the stream. Yeah. And actually sometimes that's where we'll find a lot of E. coli. And so you might go on a nice day and kick up a whole bunch of sediment. And then sometimes then there's a whole bunch of E. coli now. Ugh. So that's another thing <laughs> that people have yeah. been worried about uh, for beaches mainly. I don't know of any studies that have done it on rivers, but I can't imagine it's going to be a whole lot different. But beaches, they get concerned with a lot of wave action, a lot of sediment gets in the water, and then sometimes that can cause problems. So when you take your samples, you're taking flow and not sediment at the bottom? No, we're just taking a water sample at the top. Yeah. So we're just yeah. taking, yeah, we're not, we haven't, we haven't gotten to that point yet. It'd be cool to do, take some sediment samples, but that is no easy, <laughs> easy task. Okay. Thanks very much. Yeah. So Judy also has a question in that, in that same sort of realm. And she's asking how much does construction contribute to the sediment problem in the harbor? You know, I wish I knew the answer to that. And I think, I, I'm not sure if anyone knows the answer to that right now. Um, I imagine it's decent, you know, especially with all the construction, um, you know, that's going on everywhere. I mean, that's got to contribute a, a substantial amount, but I don't, I have, I don't know if there's been any studies that have like really partitioned out where sediment is coming from in these various locations, whether it's parking lots or what, you know, whether it's ag fields or, so I haven't seen any data like that, but I you know it's a rural area or it's an urban area there, you know, going basically starting from Franklin, you know, all the way through Bellevue. That's got to be a decent amount of sediment coming from construction. Well, couldn't they tell by, is, is there a specific spot that they test all the time? They go to the exact same spot on a regular basis on the Harpeth or they just go a variation of places? It depends on who you're asking. So the U, any kind of the USGS and any kind of probes they have, they hook those things up at one spot and they sit there for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, we have chosen several different locations, but right now we're doing just those locations because they're highly recreated. And honestly, one, they're convenient to get to. And, um, you know, and, but the main thing is that they're easy access and there's a lot of recreation going on at those spots. Okay. Um, I'd have to check. I mean, there could certainly be, you know, grad students or, you know, a master's project that someone's doing at one of the universities nearby that are going to various spots looking at sediment and trying to figure out where, you know, which watershed is it coming from. When you find out, are, is there a place on the Harpeth Conservancy website that you would post that information or? And, is that an yeah, area that yeah. someone so, could go to to find out more information that you're, as you're yeah, going? Yeah, we, we have a whole science section um, on our website that's got kind of all of our studies that we're currently working on. Um, this is one of them, but um, if we did a sediment study like that, or if we found something like, like that, then we would do kind of a little, uh, at least like a write up and point to it and um, make sure people could find it. Uh, Joanne Logan has, an, has a question. Um, do you know of any source tracking to determine where the hotspots might be? So this is a cool this is a cool question because I've got two answers to this. Um, we are currently not doing any source tracking, but what I'll say is I, I, I want to very soon. And there's kind of two questions. To that. It's are we source tracking where the E. coli is coming from or are we source tracking what it is coming from? And so source tracking where it is coming from, I think we'll, I think we might get a decent idea. We're doing various parts down the Harpeth. And so I think we'll be able to figure out, you know, which areas are the worst. Now, figuring out where, what the E. coli is coming from is, is even, is very cool because there are 
There are analyses that you can do using the DNA of E. coli, and it will, we can actually figure out whether or not it comes from a dog or humans or cows or you know, you know, birds or you know, horses. So we can actually like determine the animal associated the, to the E. coli that we're finding in our samples. But we so don't you could you farms. can track down farms that might have it. Yeah, totally. Okay. And I will, yeah, I'll say we don't have the money to do that kind of study yet, but it it's really neat, you know. And in, in the sample, you'll be I did this once when I was in grad school, and you you get kind of this, okay, in this sample, 50% was from humans, you know, 10% was from you know horses, and you know, the rest was you know from birds or you know, something like that. And it, it is kind of cool because then you can look around your area and figure out, okay, well, where are all these birds coming from? Or where, you know, where's the horse farm nearby? Or, you know, it's that kind of thing. So what do you do when you find a high concentration of E. coli? Is there a treatment program? That, or is it just you identify until? Uh, you like identify and try to figure out where it's coming from. Okay. And so it, it could be something like it's a combined sewer overflow. And so then it's like, you know, maybe then you're pushing the sewer plant to be like, you know, you've got all this, you know, money to do upgrades, you know, this is one of the ones that's a real problem spot, you know, so make, maybe make this CSO upgrade, you know, a priority, or, you know, come, you know, separate the sewer system here as a priority, as opposed to doing it some of the other places that, you know, don't get to tons of overflow. Um, and, you know, it, or, you know, it could be something as complicated as that, or something as simple as making sure you pick up after your dog. You know, all of that waste, you know, is eventually going to make it to the river. And so making sure you pick up after your dog, making sure you're, you know, that your septic system or septic tank or, you know, are, you know, maintained and up to date. It's so some of this stuff is very simple, but some of this stuff is, you know, wildly in, you know, these large infrastructure, just improvements that need to be done. Right. So Susan Morrissey has something in that, a question in that line. She was wondering if um, boaters, are a, a, signif a significant source of pollution. And she's meaning by sewage or not by fuel, not because of fuel. Hmm. I don't know. I really have no idea. I know in a lot of these beaches, the way that they get polluted is because, you know, a half a mile down, down the beach, there's a huge pipe that's going into the, you know, into the ocean. And it's basically all of, you know, the waste from the city. And so when it rains, kind of similar to our like, you know, combined sewer overflows, those pipes take out all the storm water, which might be carrying raw sewage. And then, you know, that's how they're gonna get, you know, high levels of E. coli. I would think and, that the marinas would be responsible for, for testing yeah. the water around their, their docks, no? Um, you know, I don't know who actually does the testing. In, in a place like that, it might, there might be like a city program that they actually have just to protect tourism as much as they can. Um, it wouldn't be, I doubt it's like a local nonprofit that's like putting together this, you know, this huge, you know, sampling program that's, you know, require, I think, because that's even stuff like that's hosted on, you know, USGS websites and it's on state websites and stuff like that. So I imagine it's probably state funded or, or city funded, but I, I couldn't tell you exactly how that's set up there. Uh, do golf courts courses uh, generate E. coli or mostly excessive fertilizers? And this question is coming from um, Karen Weckert. Um, so really E. coli can be a very diffuse sort, you know, diffuse source of pollution. So if you think about a golf course, it's it's not gonna be from human waste really, but I, I mean, I hope it's not, you know, I hope people are using the bathrooms correctly at a golf course, but you know, a lot of animals use golf courses, you know, there's, you know, they live there and golf courses, you know, obviously are notorious for having these large, you know, green areas that it's very easy for runoff to occur. And so I think that maybe they're, predisposed to, to have water carry any kind of contaminant or pollution into a waterway that's nearby just because there's not 
trees and brush and shrubs that really can slow down um, kind of the, that sheet flow of water when it rains. So if there are a lot of animals living on the golf course or deer or whatever, it just, they just might be, they might be less efficient as at holding it on the land than say like a, you know, a traditional forest or prairie or something like that. Maybe the drainage doesn't quite work the same as it would in a natural environment. Yeah, yeah, that's true too. They're trying to get those things to drain as fast as they can. So it, that might even expedite, you know, that stuff getting to the river. Doesn't absorb into the ground. Um, Faye Delk is asking, are there regulations about preventing drainage from construction sites? And if so, what data is that based on? Um, there's certainly regulations. I mean, you have to have a, I think that one's actually a permit that you have to have when you're doing construction and you are required in that permit to use, you'll see the silt fences that they put up, the, I don't know if you, any of you guys have seen the, the tubes, they're like mesh tubes that they fill with um, like wood chips yep. and they surround that where, you know, the drainage areas where water should drain. And supposedly those silt fences and those tube guys are supposed to capture all that sediment um, before it, you know, enters into that, you know, that drainage kind of way and gets into the river. Now, I know we're all on video and stuff, but we were in person, I'd say, raise your hand if you've ever seen one of those silt fences laying down and water just flowing over it. I'm sure we all have. So it's, yeah. they're required to do that. And they certainly, they certainly put them up, how effective they are. And I would- It's I better know. than nothing, I suppose. It's better than nothing, sure. Um, as far as regulations go, I don't, I don't think necessarily the data is based on anything. I know that they're required to do those practices. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if they get hit with a fine or anything, if, if a regulator, you know, drives by and, and sees something like that, sees like one of them laying down. Um, there might be a call that says fix that or something, but I, I don't, I, I would, you'd have to ask a construction person. I've, I've never had to deal with that side of it. And Joanne, Logan is asking, do you work at all with the NRCS on best management practices? Yeah, so um, I've done some work on just best, best management practices, not all of the different practices, but I've at least like either toyed around with some of them, actually implemented some of them, or tried to prove the effectiveness of some of them. So um, so yeah, I've done a little bit of that, but I, I wouldn't call myself an expert on, on those things. Um, but I'm pretty familiar with some of them. Hey, Judy, I'm not sure if this is coming from experience. Um, you may want to elaborate this. Uh, how much raw sewage comes from the city of Franklin? So there is no raw sewage coming from the city of Franklin on basically like an average day. It's when it rains, and really? all of that stormwater goes, gets down into the combined sewers, and then you get the, what they call these combined sewer overflows. And that, that's when you get those, um, that's when the, these basically, these pipes that are sitting down, they look like kind of big manholes kind of thing. And basically that, that combined rainwater and sewage is just coming out of that because the system can't handle that much volume of liquid. So it just, it's just spewing out of it, basically. My, um, um, our CEO just had a, an interview, actually, this might've been about a year ago. And one of, these, um, uh, one of these events happened and she's being interviewed out there right at where one of these combined sewer overflows occurred. And you can physically see toilet paper that is flowing down you know, this little channel down into the, the, the stream that was just, you know, 50 feet, 50 feet away. So that's when it's going to happen. It's not that the, it's not that the sewer plant's doing anything wrong. Mm -hmm. It's just the infrastructure as a whole, they can't handle all that volume when we get, you know, a five inch rain or a six inch rain or anything like that. There should be they should realize with all the rain that we normally get and all the flooding we've had recently, that that should be something that's that they know can happen. So, and nobody wants oh, to know, nobody they, wants to know that raw sewage is going into the rivers. 
they know it and they are required to make a public, they're required to make it available to the public, all of the data. So you can, you can actually go and look up where it happens, the date that it happened and how many gallons. And sometimes it's like thousands or hundreds of thousands of gallons came out of, you know, one of these overflows that they had. You can find it on their website. Now, if you don't know where you're looking, it might be a little tricky to find, but that's all up there. I mean, they're required by the state to, to report all of that stuff out to the general public. I'd say more, m most people don't go to the website. <laughs> <laughs> they yeah. wouldn't know. Yeah. <laughs> all yeah, right. so actually, Judy, to answer your question, you can actually go look up how much raw sewage is coming from the city of Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> So is it on the city of Franklin website? Is there yeah, like a, be, a public, yeah, a public their, works area? Under their, yeah, their water, I think it's their um, water resources um, area or something like that. Uh, if you talk for a second, I can link it if you want. So if you if you find that, go ahead and post it on the, on the, yeah, the, the I web link. Uh, Joanne is asking, what communities draw municipal water from the Harpeth? Um, say that again, sorry. What communities draw municipal water from the Harpeth River? Um, so Franklin does, um, but Franklin's kind of funny because they draw water from the Harpeth, but they also get supplemental water from Nashville and the Cumberland River. No. Oh. So... Right. It's like kind of strange because with our water treatment plant, we would pull the Franklin would pull water from the Harpeth, and then it also get some water from the Cumberland, and then all of it goes back and you know whatever is left kind of goes back into the Harpeth. So sometimes we get like more water than sometimes the Cumberland we get some of the Cumberland's water essentially. That's what I'm mm -hmm. saying, like in our watershed. Um, I don't know if that's a good thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah at least it's been treated at least once at that point um and you know that might be the only one because i don't think there are any cities big enough that are upstream that have their own water treatment plant um from franklin and certainly downstream i mean bellevue doesn't have its own utilities or anything like that and then we get out to Kingston Springs and they don't either. So it might just be Franklin that, that draws municipal water from the Harpeth. Any other questions? So Ryan, um, can you provide any information for the people that are on the call on things that they can do to help with this issue or just things that they can just in general do in their daily lives, ch make changes in their regular habits um, to, to help in this issue? Sure, I mean, I think that any kind of sediment prevention um, is good. So, you know, not mo you know, not mowing up to the edge of the river, um, you know, you wanna keep, that a buffer there with trees and shrubs to help prevent sediment from, from kind of flowing off of your yard, yard into the river. Um, again, you know, picking up after your dog, that can be a substantial source of E. coli. Um, and then there, there are certainly, you know, larger things like, you know, advocating for, you know, certain, you know, policies or legislation that might, that might give more leeway to say a sewer treatment plant or more leeway to, you know, not, you know, for them to not having to like, you know, build out this infrastructure, spend money on, you know, um, these sewer overflows or whatever. Um, Cause some of that stuff does happen on a pretty regular basis where they, you know, they certainly, you know, in order for growth to occur, which means money's gonna be made. You need to make sure your utilities grow. You need larger water treatment plants. You need larger wastewater treatment plants. If the wastewater treatment plants get larger, then is that gonna cause, you know, you know, more sewage? And if they're not, if it's not handled correctly, then so there's 
there's a lot of kind of interconnected things that go into this. Um, you know, the other thing too, is if you're, you know, if you're going on a hike or going on a walk and I mean, it sounds crazy, but we had one guy call us one time and he saw that one of his neighbors or a guy that he was walking by his house had a, a, a pile, a huge pile of chicken manure that was, he had piled up right next to the river. And basically it was just kind of slowly fallen in. And so something like that, that's a huge problem. Yeah. So, you know, even just kind of keeping your eyes out and kind of, you know, knowing what you're looking for, or kind of being like, oh, that, you know, that looks not a, you know, not a great situation or, you know, you know, erosion issues too. If you see a lot of erosion occurring or, you know, a lot of sediment building up at certain spots and, you know, maybe trying to figure out what's happening there. So there's a little bit of kind of investigative, you know, aspect that we can do with this, but, you know, the very simplest thing is, you know, pick up after your dog and, you know, just, you know, try to prevent, you know, that, you know, sediment from getting into the river. Also, if you own land next to the river, try not to leave debris next to the mm -hmm. river because rivers flood. I know I have a creek next to mine. I'm always amazed. I have seen engines go down it. <laughs> I have seen um, someone left a, a t like a, this would not be, well, it was bad because it clogged everything up, but they had left a bunch of logs on the side of the creek and they all came down the creek. <laughs> so, so be conscientious of, of what you leave on the side of any uh, running water or any water. Oh, I've seen, yeah, we've seen sheds that, uh, you know, end up in people's backyards that have flowed, you know, <laughs> flowed <laughs> down for a mile on the creek. Um, Someone, I just posted in the chat where the sanitary sewer release and overflows, basically the documentation that the city of Franklin does. And so you can see the date and time it happened, the location, status, duration, and then you know, estimated volume. And some of them are 50, you know, 50 gallons and some of them are 66,000 gallons. So, um, yeah. well, that one's 2 million, 2 million gallons. So there you go. And looks like they do publish a report, but that's at least um, probably some of the more recent ones. Oh, they do, look at this. So which, what, what should they be looking for here? This is a list of releases. Um, yeah, honestly, it, the other thing, too, one of the cool things that we try to do, and we love when people call us um, like a, about these because it's hard for us to be everywhere. Mm -hmm. But if you, you can kind of look at the locations and there's gonna probably be like four or five locations that may pretty regularly occur. You don't have to like go to the report and look at all of them for the past couple of years there'll probably be a couple locations that mm. occur pretty regularly. And so if it rains, you know, and you're near that location and pop over and be like, wow, yeah, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's flowing out of this right now. Let us know. Um, you know, we'd love to try to get some, some, you know, E. coli data just downstream of these things to see really like how high does E. coli get after an event like this? So that's one of the things it's hard for us to catch because, you know, you know, if it rains an inch, you know, am I, are we all driving to, you know, 30 different locations to check them? But um, there are, you know, it, you know, if you live, you know, near one of these places and it, it, you know, rains two inches and then lets up, you know, take a walk down the street and, you know, see if it's overflowing. Mm -hmm. It's good to know that this resource is here, especially mm -hmm. for someone who lives down in Franklin, they can check it on a regular basis. Yeah. And I think the, the national one is, I think, is a little bit easier to find, but I know the, the one that we're 